Welcome to Engineered for Impact, a podcast helping engineers learn and think more about how they can have a positive social impact with their careers. In this episode, I talk to Dr. Rachel Floriani, an associate professor at the University of Vermont in the departments of mechanical engineering, electrical and biomedical engineering, and food systems. Her current research includes a focus on novel materials for the cultivated meat industry, which is the focus of today's discussion. We talk about Rachel's interdisciplinary journey to working on cultivated meats, the control that engineers can have over the mechanical properties of cultivated meats, and the funding constraints for cellular agriculture and cultivated meat research. Additionally, we talk about the value of engineers understanding business ideas and how this informs both Rachel's teaching and research agendas. We discuss work-life balance in academia and Rachel's advice for people who are interested in entering academia. We also talk about how to test your fit for research and how to pitch research ideas to professors. You'll find show notes with valuable resources related to this episode and ways to support the podcast at engineeredforimpact.show forward slash Rachel. That's R-A-C-H-A-E-L. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe, leave us feedback or share it with a friend or colleague. So, without further ado, here's Rachel. So, my name is Rachel Floriani. I am an associate professor in the mechanical engineering and biomedical engineering departments at the University of Vermont. I also am affiliated with material science and food systems. So, if I was to put together in a few sentences what I work on, I work on materials we find in the natural world to try and solve societal problems. And I know that seems broad, but right now I have projects from delivering uh, novel therapeutics for cancer treatment all the way to trying to grow muscle tissue for cultivated meat. Terrific. So... Yeah, there's, there's there's a bit to unpack there. Uh, I guess <laughs> what what are the what are the human challenges that you're trying to to solve at the moment? At the moment, I would say um, hunger, trying to improve food security around the world, to reduce human suffering overall. Previously, a lot of my work was focused on improving the quality of life. And I still think that's relevant, but since my focus has shifted more to incorporate the cellular ag um, part of everything that I do, I just feel like I'm I'm helping the world out. I am I am my my skills are serving a greater purpose if I look to trying to help with world hunger and food security. That's terrific. Um, I found your background to be really interesting because you've, you've spanned quite a number of engineering disciplines. Um, perhaps you could take me through sort of where you started off and sort of how you got to be, uh, working on what you're currently working on. Yeah. So I started off, um, going into biomedical engineering and that was at a predominantly engineering school. I didn't know what engineering was. I came from a relatively small high school, and no one in my family had graduated from college. But I excelled academically, and I was pretty eager, and I knew I wanted to do something with people. So I went ahead and majored in biomedical engineering. Towards the end of my degree, I didn't know what I wanted to do in terms of industry, And I focused on one of my professors and I asked her, uh, what do I need to do to do what you do? And she said, you need to have a PhD. And I said, okay. Um, And so it wasn't until fall of my senior year that I realized that that's what I wanted to do. I actually wanted to be a professor. My interest as far as the applications of engineering lied more in the mechanical material side. And 20 years ago, when I was going through biomedical engineering, they were still trying to figure out the curriculum 
And there were aspects of material science and mechanical engineering that I just didn't have, that I wanted. So that is why I went into a master's with mechanical engineering. And I say master's because I didn't want to do another four years of college. Who does? Who does? Um, so I started, I started with a master's, loved my project, loved my advisor. She was, is an incredible mentor. So I'm, I went on to get my PhD in mechanical engineering. Um, I will say that the PhD in mechanical engineering is because I wanted to be a professor. And with a mechanical engineering degree, I was able to apply to many more programs and departments than I would have if I had a PhD in biomedical engineering. And that's my story. That's my story because of what I felt comfortable teaching, the type of students that I wanted to advise. I just felt more comfortable in mechanical engineering. But what's really nice, as you mentioned, my, my past and my education is kind of um, it weaves in and out, is I stand, um, I, what do I want to say, I am unique in my department. Um, for what I do, for the research that I do. I work with literal rocket scientists, those who came from NASA, um, and then there's me. (laughs) And I do tissue engineering and drug delivery. But it is a great exposure for the students who all, who stumble upon me and, and they sort of like, look, and they're like, wait, but you're a mechanical engineer. And I was like, yeah, pretty cool, right? Um, you can you can do a lot with mechanical engineering. So I, I think I made the right choice. I really do. Uh, I think I have a way more influence on the students in a positive way, getting the PhD that I did and then being in the department that I am. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, how much do you feel like having those role models really helped that journey. So you mentioned your, one of your professors during your undergrad, uh, and then also your master's supervisor as well. How, how critical do you think they were in that journey? A hundred percent. If, if I, so let me be more specific. And again, this is my, my journey. Uh, my senior year, I had a female professor for the first time, for the first time. And she was energetic and she was uh, just loud and smart. And I, for the first time, realized that if that I could be a professor Um, and she was the one that I spoke with and she's the one who said, you need a Ph.D. If it wasn't for her, I would not be here. If it was, I don't know where I would be miserable in a job. Maybe no. Um, I. I wouldn't be here. And then my advisor, who she instilled in me the importance of having a life and working. And I think that's important too, because I may not be here if I didn't focus on my relationships, my health, um, having a family. So yeah, uh, those mentors are critical. And then today, you know, my, my mentor tree, if, if you will, has greatly expanded. And it's not just females. Those just happen to be the ones that um, got on my radar first. But um, mentors keep me in line. And I don't think mentors are important just in the beginning. There are many times where I have doubted myself. Many times. Um if imposter syndrome had like a poster child, I feel like it would be me. And without my mentors getting me over uh, those humps, I don't think I'd be here either. Mm. You mentioned their sort of work-life balance and, you know, the importance of, of striking that balance, uh, particularly in academia. How does that sort of look for you? Because my impression of, of some academics is, is sort of, they look very hermity. They sort of do, do their, do their research and it's sort of all consuming, uh, and it can sometimes be, uh, quite a drain and quite a unbalanced work-life balance, I guess. Yeah. Um, 
I will say that having a supportive partner is one of the ways I can do it. Um, and that's, I don't, I don't think it has to be a partner or a husband. Any sort of support you have is critical. So the work-life balance isn't about spending time with kids and being in the office. It really is the support when you need it. And it's like rowing a boat. So there's two people in the boat and one person may get tired or they get like a, a cramp somewhere and they just have to stop. And so you know and you have to depend on that other person to keep rowing and keep the boat moving in that general direction. And so my life is full of supportive, wonderful people that when I am down, they keep the boat going forward and they remind me that, you know, they got my back and I just have to pick up where I left off and, and keep going. So that is, that's my work-life balance is just, yeah, finding that support system outside of work. That's a wonderful analogy. I really like that. <laughs> um, let's change topics slightly and discuss cultivated meats. So um, in in your bio, you've got that you're collaborating on research and product development across a lot of fields, uh, including tissue engineering, cultivated meat, cell culture, media development, anti-cancer therapeutics, drug delivery implants, uh, wound dressings and tissue sealants. Uh, it's a hugely broad array of things. Um, I guess what have you? What are some of the the biggest takeaways or the key takeaways that you've you've learned from working across just so many fields? The ability to translate one idea to an to another area of research. That's. I don't. I think that's where I've been able to expand what I do. In terms of wound healing or tissue sealants or drug delivery, that is no different than making cultivated meat. There is a degree at which I have to control those materials in a very reputable, rigorous, robust manner. As an engineer, that's my role. I, I have to provide that. And um, in terms of delivering the best meat, you can make it as complicated and glamorous as you want it to. You can put in stuff in there that's going to release little flavors, or you can put stuff in there that will encourage cells to grow, or maybe you have certain cells that you don't want to grow and you stop that. Or let's say you want the scaffold or the material to attach to the tissue, or you want the scaffold to have different stiffnesses to control the development of different tissues. All of that comes from everything that I've done before. So tissue engineering and orthopedics, that's what my PhD dissertation was on. I've continuously worked in tissue engineering, going from using human cells to now animal cells for making meat is, it's not that big of a jump. Um, and I think that's what's amazing because then everyone in my lab who's working on all of these very seemingly disconnected projects are able to help each other tremendously. Mm, that's really interesting. How, how much control, how much control can you have over, over these materials and in the context of, of cultivated meat, if you're designing some sort of connective tissue or, or some sort of, um, I guess, structural sort of element, how much control do we, can we really have over the, the mechanical properties? And I guess then down the downstream sort of, uh, texture and feel and experience of actually eating that product? Yeah. Great, great question. So it boils down to a relationship and that relationship has four main points and that is the composition of the material, the structure, the properties of that material, and then the function. And in regards to any objective that is presented in front of me, I want to make fat, I want to make muscle, I want to make them together. Maybe I want to have some tendon in there. People eat tendon. Um, I start with the composition of the material. What modifications can we make to try and control the cells to do what we want? And then we know that if we can take that composition and make different structures, well, then we can start to make different materials. For instance, if I was to take this, this solution and I was to make little microparticles or, 
or something like that, that becomes a microcarrier. If I was to take this and make a, I don't know, a, a steak shaped gel, then that, that becomes a different structure. And everything from, is it fibrous? What do the pores look like? The anisotropy, all of that we control. So then once you take and combine the composition with the specific structure that you want, we have to manipulate the components to give us the properties that we want. And it's a relationship. So of course, the composition, the structure, and the properties are all connected. And sometimes we have to say, okay, what, what wins the structure or the properties? But ultimately, once you have those three things put together, it has to perform a certain function. And that function is to be muscle, to be fat. Um, what is the texture? What is the taste? Those are two things I don't know right now. But we, and I do say we because all of us, all of us work together. We have the ability to manipulate a material so much that we can achieve the structure and the mechanical properties that we want. And we have even gone as far as in the lab, proving to ourselves that we can go from a wide range of properties and structures for fat, tissue, for bone, and for muscle. So it's pretty, it's pretty exciting. And without going into the details, it really is just looking at the composition of a material, the structure, the properties, and then the function that you're trying to achieve. Okay. So... It seems like in the last like year or so, year or two maybe, there's been a lot of companies bringing a very basic version of what you just described to market. And it's quite different from sort of the traditional textured sort of protein uh, sort of structures that have sort of traditionally been out there in terms of alternate protein uh, products. Uh, it sounds like there's quite a lot on the horizon potentially if if these things actually get commercialized and get to market there could be quite a broad like a much broader range of of cultivated meats that ends up end up on the shelves is that yeah so yeah so are you referring to products as in the scaffolding for the meat those types of products yeah yeah like in terms of scaffolding and and sort of going from sort of just having like some sort of paste which is heated and compressed and get some sort of texture to something that's more complicated and actually starts looking uh like something that looks more like i guess conventional or traditional meat products um i do i do see the opportunities for the market um being there and i see a lot more science and well, a lot more science and research being done and a lot more companies popping up that focus on the scaffolds. I really do. Because right now, if we look across the industry, um, there are companies that are trying to do all of it. And I think as they look to scaling, as they look to manufacturing, they may start to realize, okay, this is sort of, this is outside of our wheelhouse. Maybe we'll, we'll just go ahead and we'll buy this instead of making it. And so because of that, I think you're going to see an increase in demand. The materials that people are using now, it is a very logical transition of going from these plant-based meats to now trying to create this cultivated meat. And the goal is to create something with a different texture and a different feel and a different look. And so as we start to differentiate between different types of tissues, whether it's between different animals or, or whatever, I think that you will start to see more companies pop up. I do, because there is, the possibilities are endless. And if you look at what is available, um, I think there's definitely room for growth in terms of material options, yeah. Do you think that companies may are likely to underestimate the difficulty of integrating these types of products into like their offering themselves? Um, maybe it's changing. It's remarkable. Within the past year, I've seen changes. You, it, if you go on LinkedIn and you start looking at some of these well-known producers and you start looking at the job openings that they have, 
Now I'm not talking one or two. I want you to look at 10, 20. The postings now for manufacturing engineers, material scientists, mechanical engineers, you see an uptick in those job openings. And I think there's a greater appreciation now for when they actually have to scale to make their investors happy. I think they realize, oh, oh my goodness, like we need some engineers in here. The biologists are great. The prototypes are great, but a lot more needs to be put into this industrial part of the industry. And so, you know, one, one thing that I love about what I do and the students that I work with and, and speak with is I am continuously reminding them that we are so needed as engineers and we may not think of growing food as an industry for us, but it is an industry with unknown problems in scaling and manufacturing. Who are you going to call? You're going to call mechanical engineers. And so the seniors in my courses are just completely mind blown. And then they go to LinkedIn and they say, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And it's like, yeah, it's really, really critical. And for that also, I think you're going to see more scaffolding companies um, as, as uh, these meat producers start to sort of narrow down um, their productivity in-house. Yeah. I definitely had that that same experience myself maybe like a year and a half, two years ago uh, when at sort of like an online conference, someone messaged me and said, hey, uh, if you're doing fluid mechanics, maybe you should look into alternate proteins because they've got bioreactors and th there might be something there. And then that kind of opened my eyes to, I had that exact same sort of, yeah, uh, <laughs> sudden realization that there's this whole field that like needed potentially needed sort of my experience in, in fluid mechanics, but then just like all sorts of disciplines as well. Uh, and it's something that over the last yeah year and a half has, um, has been looking more into it. It just seems like there's, there's just such a huge need for engineers at the moment, uh, especially going from that sort of lab bench set up proof of concept to actually being able to bring a product to market and have like scalable facilities. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And there is a broad range of engineering disciplines that are needed. You're absolutely right. Uh, my impression is that early on biomedical engineers were sought after because it made the most sense. This industry is borrowing a lot of what it wants to do from the medical industry. So it made perfect sense. But again, the disciplines are respected because of their areas of expertise. And oftentimes biomedical engineers are really good at integrating the engineering and the biology, not necessarily manufacturing. And so for, especially for students, like fluid dynamics to think, oh, well, how am I gonna help out the world doing fluid dynamics? And it's like, well, we have some, yeah, we have some bioreactors over here, or you have some chemical engineers or, um, even, even students who are, I forget what the major is, uh, or they want to become br brewery masters or like head brewers or something like that. Um, and letting them know that, you know, growing cells in cellular agriculture is very similar to that like exact same setup. And then all of a sudden, you know, these challenges don't seem so daunting. But I think we do have to bring them to those individual disciplines and say, hey, you're pretty intuitive at solving this problem. Can you help us out? Yeah. Well, what sort of disciplines do people in your lab have as their backgrounds? Oh, great. Um, a lot of mechanical engineers and a lot of biomedical engineers. So uh, the students who had the similar um, path as me, where they started off in biomedical engineering and then kind of wanted to focus more on the materials mechanics side, a lot of students with that background I am welcoming a new student, though, who is trained as a culinary chef. And so that is going to bring an incredible experience. And we talk a lot about texture and, and feel and stiffness of these cultivated meat products. But as my soon-to-be student, Kevin, has reminded me, it will need to be cooked. And if we are looking to put these into world-class restaurants where people are are willing to pay this premium price, you're going to have these chefs cooking this meat and they are going to need to know, do you broil it? Do you fry it? 
Um, and so that was sort of explained to me. And so the idea that we can create these different products in the lab and then in-house hand it over to someone who knows how to cook meat and then tell us you need more fat or you need to put this in there. I feel very, very blessed. And so it, it brings that motivation for the engineers to do what they want to do is going to come from within our own group as well. So that sounds really exciting. It's kind mm -hmm. of tightening that feedback loop of actually like, instead of having to wait for it to get to the market and be out there in the wild, you actually get to play with that a little bit in, in the lab and uh, yeah, really tighten up that, that experience. Yeah, I think it's going to be absolutely incredible. And the students I have now are really looking forward to it. And he's, he sold me on, on bringing him on into my lab because, and I will never forget this, he said, if you want the average consumer to adopt a new food product, who better to sell it than a celebrity chef? And I was like, oh my gosh, like you're, at, like you're absolutely right. Um, and so I was like, cool, tell me more. And so he's, he's joining the group and it's going to be absolutely wild. That's awesome. Yeah. What do you think are some of the biggest challenges that the cultivated meat research industry or uh, space is, is facing at the moment? Um, funding is one of them. You can't get very far if you don't have the money to do the research. And a lot of attention is focused on the investor dollars for all these companies. But again, they're not set up to do R&D. They're set up to actually manufacture a product. So even my own experience is there are funding agencies that still don't quite understand what we're trying to do with cultivated meat. And so it's, you know, do you, do you submit this to the EPA? Do you submit this to USDA? And then, you know, they say, no, go to NIH. And NIH says, no, go to NSF. And so I think just the funding agencies themselves need to get on board. And that executive order coming from um, President Biden really did help saying that we needed to focus on biotechnology and here are some areas that we need to look at for alternative proteins. But funding certainly is, is one of the issues. Um, I, I would say that's it. Uh, I have never found a more collaborative and friendly group of people. I haven't. I, wow, like I, I absolutely love it. So right now, as far as the research and development, we are sharing ideas. I've come, I'm collaborating with people all over that I, I never thought I would. So we're there. The manpower and the interest is there. It would just be really, really nice to have the financial backing to do that in academia. Yeah, that's really interesting. So it, it kind of sounds like the bottleneck there is just the clarity in the funding source or whether the, what the pathway should sort of be or the mechanism, like who the funding should be coming from or who labs should be going to, to request funding. All of it, but also just a clear understanding of what the impact will be. And it, it may seem obvious, especially those of us in cell ag, but to some people it's not, especially those that are looking at so many applications that have to deal with sustainability and climate change. There's, there's so many. So I think making sure that they understand the societal impact and the importance of getting politicians on board as well. So it's not just federal funding here in the United States, the states have a budget here in the state of Vermont, uh, there is money out there for agriculture. And so even here, getting them to, to really understand that cellular agriculture is agriculture. They see it as the opposite of agriculture, actually. Um, so really getting people to understand, getting people to drop their biases. Um, yeah, those are some of the major hurdles. Mm. So it's kind of a, a policy uh, advocacy type work that needs to be done to really improve the situation here? I think so. Sometimes when I think about it, it's, it's like COVID. So there was a lot of research going on around that. And there were a lot of brilliant scientists that all of a sudden people didn't start listening to because there were politicians. And then it was like, well, what side of the fence are you on? I see that it, with cultivated meat. I really do. I see that same thing. 
Um, and so if uh, I don't have a solution to that, but I, I just kind of see like, those are the hurdles, right? Like, are you going to get them to listen to the scientists? Like, what are you going to do? I don't know. Yeah. I, hopefully the, uh, the, the presidential, uh, announcement that you, you mentioned before helps is helping move the needle there a little bit, but it does sound like there's still plenty of room for others to come in with policy or advocacy work and really try to depoliticize this issue as well as uh, just clarify people's understanding of of what cultivated meats are and where it sort of fits in uh, amongst traditional agriculture and that it's not necessarily anti-agriculture. Yes, yes. But it's, it's not going to happen overnight. Hmm. And there are a lot of people who have incredible patience over this, over the growth of this new industry. And, um, you know, there's many analogies to it that many people use, but it's, it's new. And just like any other paradigm shift in society, this is global. If there is a paradigm shift, it will take a long time for people to adopt that change. And all we can do is stay true to the science stay true to our values and keep moving forward. I think the need will overcome people's biases in the future. Do you worry that the difficulties with the funding may hamstring development in some way, or that some people may become, I guess, uh, disenchanted with the idea of doing research in this space and, and sort of not proceed? Or do you think there's enough funding to sort of keep things moving? Um, to keep things moving, maybe, but again, it's a very small group that is very moving slowly compared compared to a lot of the other uh, areas of research out there. Um, I do know of academics who have decided not to go down this path because of the lack of funding. It is much easier for them, and you can imagine a closely related field being tissue engineering for wound healing or, or for orthopedics. People are okay. Uh, there's a lot of money from NIH. There's a lot of money from NSF. And so if they are successful right there and you mention to them shifting somewhere where there's there may not be, a, there's, a fu- there's a future, um, but we don't know where it's gonna take us and there might not be any money. Well then no, <laughs> they're, not gonna, they're not gonna move over. Um, and that's un- that's understandable. Are we missing a lot of great ideas? Yeah, I bet we are. So do we need money? Do we need to dangle money in front of people? Maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard dynamic when progress in the field just takes many years. And people, if you want to make really good progress, you need people who are willing to come in and build their career around a topic, um, especially in academia where things can get very specialized very quickly. If you're not having people who are willing to come in and become the world leading expert on how to build uh, a s- tissue that feels and tastes a certain way, then uh, it's going to be really hard to to make progress in that field. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I am lucky to have um, you know, here in the state, some wonderful researchers, some pioneers, Professor David Kaplan at Tufts being one of those, where his entire career hasn't been on cell ag. It hasn't been around that long. But because of his work and his background in, in biomedical engineering and in material science, he was able to make that transition. And there's many other brilliant people out there, but they don't have the voice. And so Professor Kaplan, he stepped up and he used his voice. And I like that. I, I like doing the science. I love science, but I love motivating people to do the science. I love motivating people to latch onto my values and my interest and get excited. And so in this, I wouldn't say early, but in this stage where cell ag and cultivated meat is growing and becoming more popular, I want to be at the front of that train. 
I, I want to be able to encourage all of those. I don't have the money to dangle, but I can try and I can get those people on board. And so it is fun. I'm having fun. Um, and I, I'm excited to see where it's going to go. But I really don't mind being part of a relatively small group trying to harness energy and enthusiasm from really bright people who can help solve this problem. Hmm. Who You mentioned values there. Who, what sort of values are you most excited to see in, in, in prospective students and uh, researchers coming into the field? Uh, well, there's two. So when you mentioned students, I... <sighs> My hope is that students value their own worth and their own education and intelligence. If they can leave the lab or the university knowing that what they have is valuable, then they will make a change. They will. They will go out there. They'll have a greater voice. And the values that I often talk about are looking at humanity, looking at pain and suffering over some of these customs that we're used to, some of these likes that we're used to. Um, I don't, I can, I can phrase that differently. I can phrase that better. Um, I don't know. I guess like, don't be an asshole. I don't know. No, but the, the I think value... that's a good approach to life just in general. Like <laughs> okay. if you want to bring people into your lab, I think that's probably a, a good, good rule to have. Yeah. That's one of them. No, it's, it's that, you know, you have a responsibility to take care of the world. We really do. I think as engineers, it's a, it's a, it is a profession. You can become a professional engineer. And if you stamp a building and that building kills people, you will go to jail. So put it on the flip side. You have the privilege of really taking these ideas to the next level for the greater good, not just for making money. And I think, I think that is my value, is looking at the greater good of what we can do, not necessarily how many papers we can publish, how much grant money we can get. That's, that's not what I value the most. Hmm. Yeah, I think engineers have a really unique opportunity to to see the world as being fundamentally malleable and then actually acting on that and designing something, researching something that has very tangible real world impact and they can sort of get out there and test it and see something happening in the real world as a result of the work and the effort that they've put in. Um, I think that's a really valuable thing that engineers can just bring to bear on the world when they combine that with that notion of, you know, we can actually improve things. We can identify, you know, unique opportunities that engineers are particularly well suited to contribute to, uh, like the cultivated meat space, like helping the scale up, uh, of, of factories and, um, uh, and businesses, but also figuring out fundamentally, how do we, how do we do research? How do we actually create products uh, that that work in the way that people want them to work? Um, combining those sort of those two mindsets, engineers really seem to be able to shift the needle in this space. Oh yeah, um, I mean implementing our design so that consumers, whether that be you know, politicians and states, the government doesn't matter. Consumers need to adopt <clears throat> our designs, or it doesn't matter. So. I try and get the, under, the engineers to understand that there are almost two types of jobs that they can get. One is just doing the type of engineering where you're modifying someone else's design and you, you serve a purpose and you're going to make a paycheck and you're going to go home knowing that you did a good job. Or you're going to go out there and you're going to get a job and it's going to be risky because you want to make a change. And so that is where those values come into play mm. is I want my students to say, you know what, my ideas are valuable and I have some ideas for how we can make a change. And so you combine that with the intelligence and the background of an engineer, whoo, unstoppable. Absolutely. 
Yeah, it reminds me of this idea of um, replaceability in that, you know, if you're looking to really have the biggest impact that you can on the world, you look for places where you're not particularly replaceable. Like if, if you're going to go into a job where uh, anyone with an engineering degree can kind of do that work and you're just kind of like, yeah, part of the system and um, sort of that first category of, of jobs that you mentioned, then you're highly replaceable and anyone can kind of do it. But if you're one of the only people in the world who's going to go ask a question and try to answer it uh, and, you know, do so in a way that helps really improve the world uh, and you're not, no one else is going to do that and you're not very replaceable, then that's, that's sort of the domain of, of jobs or of research where you can really have a positive impact as an engineer. Yeah. And you want to know uh, an important variable in that is business experience or business education. So for a student to understand the pros and the cons and the risk with going into a job like that, oftentimes they're at startups, right? And just, just understanding that and having that perspective because sometimes engineers don't understand business and they do almost want a job where they're replaceable because they don't stand out. The company is probably huge and they're going to get that paycheck. But understanding the risk and the uh, impacts and the reward of doing as you suggested, having that voice and going out there to make a change. Um, I do think having an understanding of industry and of business in general is very helpful. Have you had to develop that in the course of your work? I definitely talk about it in my classes all the time. I remind my students all the time that they can have the best designs possible, but if they don't speak up for themselves and they don't speak up for their ideas, it will never happen. No one will ever use it. It will never be implemented into society. Nothing will happen. So in my classes, all students have to write a business model and a pitch for an idea. And they have to get up there and they have to sell it. And sometimes they're like, why do we have to do that? And I'm like, well, you want a job, don't you? You have to sell yourself. Plus, just get used to sticking your neck out there. So I incorporate a business pitch and a business model into all of my classes. And previous graduate students of mine have taken multiple business courses in our business school. And it has really helped them as a person and in their career. Yeah, that's really awesome. I love that idea of, of having to do the pitch. I wish yeah. I wish I could have done more of that with like my engineering work because uh, I did commerce as well as a, as a bachelor's uh, alongside yeah. engineering. And I found that actually to be a bit frustrating to begin with because it was like I really enjoyed doing the, the maths and the, the engineering side of things and less of the business. But in retrospect now, I found it to be very valuable and just it opens up a different perspective on how to look at uh, sort of how things operate in the real world, I guess. Uh, whereas engineering can be very first principles and uh, at times a bit abstracted from actually the real world of how do you how do you build a business around something or how do you actually like bring something that you've created from an engineering perspective to the point where others want to use it. Oh, yes, where they they want to use it and they're able to use it because it's actually being produced. Hmm. So in classes in even senior design, they have to come up with something and they build it and they do all the math. And if, you know, it's taking on too much stress, what do they do? They add another pipe or pull, whatever. They add stuff. And really, if you're going to industry, it's not about maximizing your design, it's about opt optimizing. And then you got to think multiple steps ahead and say, can anyone build this? Could we ever scale this? So yeah, I think it's critical because unless you have that mindset of this, this really is what's likely to succeed, you're wasting your time and you're wasting your company's time and then they're going to get rid of you, especially if you're at a startup. So... <laughs> Is that does this does this uh, mentality influence the way you're structuring your research and your research agenda going forward? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, especially since getting into the cultivated meat field, where scalability is huge 
Mm. You want to scale and you want to manufacture. And what is the top thing about manufacturing? Reduce costs. That's the number one thing. Try and make it as fast as possible, cheap as possible, with the least amount of manpower possible. In terms of my research, I want what we do to matter, and I want what we do to be translatable. So we may not scale and we may not manufacture everything, but no one is going to listen to us and no companies are going to work with us if it's not at least scalable. And so I have my students really think about it. And, and that's the point is most of them are going to go into industry as well and think, you know, this may be a wonderful design, but how much does it cost to make it and can you scale? So yeah, it has affected my research and that never really came into play or was part of my thought process prior to entering the cultivated meat industry because it's such a big deal, right? Like everyone is talking about, no one's talking about how do we scale automobiles? No, no one has that question. So, so yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a different way of thinking, especially for me, even in the medical industry, we don't scale, who scales? So unless, unless you're in pharmaceuticals. So I, I, it definitely has changed my research, but it's, it's carried over. It's not just a cultivated meat issue anymore. I think it's a very important aspect of training engineers. How to, how to slim it down, kiss it, keep, keep it simple, sweetheart. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, what do you think are some of the biggest difficulties when it comes to that scale up, uh, maybe particularly for scaffolding or, or for it sort of any aspect of your research when it actually sort of when when the rubber hits the road, like what are the actual what are, what do you think are going to be the biggest difficulties companies are going to face? Uh, well, the reason I'm smiling um, is because you're asking this question. The biggest problems are fluid dynamics and thermodynamics. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They are. Bioreactors, it seems obvious, right? Like you have flow, you have different differentials, you have different gradients. How is any of that going to happen? And then even if you think of manufacturing materials, like that is a flow. If, if it's melt, you got to deal with viscosity. That's all temperature dependent. What types of diffusion do you have going on during that process? So it's all fluids and thermo. Any, any problem we have with scaling, it's always fluids, to be honest. Yeah, that... That intuitively makes a lot of sense to me because yeah. fluids and thermo, but particularly fluids, is uh, is just a strange, strange area when you start talking about scaling. Because um, suddenly, like a lab, sort of lab bench or laptop uh, sized bioreactor, if you want to scale that like a thousand times, then the fundamental like fluid sort of interactions you're going to get are just going to be drastically different. Absolutely, especially with chemistry. So for us, scaling would be large chemical reactions, trying to produce a lot of modified polymers. And so, as you know, you can't go from a 100 milliliter round bottom flask to maybe like a giant vessel. So even going from a round bottom flask to a beaker, oh my God, right? Like completely changes. And then you go from a 50 milliliter beaker, let's say, to like a four liter beaker, complete, forget about it. You got to redo the entire protocol. It's the stirring. It's the, fl it's the fluid dynamic, Sean. That is the biggest problem. Maybe I need a fluid dynamics person in my lab. Maybe that's what I need. It sounds like you might need you might need <laughs> someone. There might be some uh, some openings in the coming years for fluid mechanics in your lab. By the sounds of it, absolutely yes, I think so. <laughs> yes. What do you think? What What would you be like? Be most excited about seeing people coming into the field doing? Having more conversations across across the aisle. So taking a lot of the founders, which have the, the focus in the health benefits, a lot of the biologists, and you have engineers, but I think they lean more towards the biology. And then you have industrial engineers, manufacturing engineers, um, I, can't, I guess fluid dynamics, that's mechanical engineers. They need to start talking to each other because it's just like what I talked about in my lab and in my class. It is a waste of time and money to build this amazing product, this amazing, uh, you know, beta test. And then, and then you're like, okay, we're going to scale, we're going to manufacture. And that's when you engage a manufacturing engineer. Nope. 
Nope. And so that's what I would like to see because that will help the industry move faster and that will drive the, the cost down. Yeah, I could also see that helping as a sort of like side product of that, helping with funding because it sort of, it shows that the research is closer to the actual like commercialization and making money at the end of it. So the perhaps that also helps with with getting more funding into the space because it actually like that that chain reaction of do do research that is tightly correlated with what the industry wants to do actually results in the industry being able to do it better scale it more easily at a, at lower cost and hopefully make more profit as a result of it yep absolutely and I don't know if it will be grant funding in academia or if it will be investors funding in industry because plenty of these companies are also doing their own research. Um, but I, either way, there are people out there who want to see these groups, who want to see this crosstalk, these interdisciplinary teams. Um, and so the more vocal those people can become, I think the better it will be because, again, people follow the money. And so if you have NSF or if you have different investors saying, hey, we want to see your likelihood of scaling where, where are your engineers on, on your team, then I, then I think it will happen. But yeah, I think there, it's going to be more aggressive in terms of put your, put your money where your mouth is and really manufacture it. Yeah. And we've seen that recently, right? Like companies that can't manufacture or scale, they're, they're out. They're out of the game. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. I guess I wanted to sort of jump back a little bit to to the robot analogy and ha what academic life looks uh, like for you uh, and sort of learn a bit about who do you think is particularly well suited for academic research in this field uh, and maybe some, are, are there any common misconceptions you'd like to dispel about uh, sort of academic life research and, you know, becoming a, an academic researcher? Um, well, when you say academic researcher, do you mean a graduate student or a professor or a research professor? In what context? Um, I guess maybe two contexts here could be interesting. Like one is the sort of career academic, so sort of the professor tract. Um, and the second is perhaps doing master's or PhD by research, and then uh, maybe becoming a postdoc or going out into industry, because that seems to be something that's a little bit more applicable for the cultivated meat space. Um, yeah. Yeah. So research in academia. Um, well, I'll start with myself. So as a professor, as faculty in academia, I teach and I do research. And I care about both. I actually became a professor because I thought I would just teach and no, that's not right. So I end up doing research, but it's exhausting. And my students see how exhausted I am, but it is not necessarily an effect of academia. It is because I care and my students see the, that as well. So I do get burnt out sometimes, but I'm prepared for it because I care. And when we care, we have the choice to say yes or no. And I very rarely regret my decisions. If I miss a couple hours of sleep, if, if this happens or if that happens, or I have a crappy lecture one day, it is okay. Again, because that boat keeps going. But um, it is it is hard. It's hard when you care about something so much and you really can put so much time into something. Um, so, I mean, the con is that, yeah, I'm exhausted. And I think sometimes people look at me and they're like, oh, no way, no way are we going to go into academia. But, but my students, both in the classroom and in my laboratory, can see my enthusiasm, can see my excitement and the drive I have to do what I do. And so despite looking frazzled, I encourage them. I really truly believe I encourage them. I have so many students during every single one of my courses, every semester, come up to me and say, I wanna do what you do. I wanna I want go into the lab. 
How do I get into graduate school? How do I do all of this? So I know it's working. I know that I'm encouraging them to not only go into graduate research, whether or not they become professors, I don't know. None of my students have, but that doesn't mean that they're not doing something valuable. They have gone to industry. But um, academic research is hard. It's very hard, but you're there because you care. It's like my kids. My kids are hard. It's hard being a parent. It is hard taking care of children, but I care about them. So I feed them and I make sure they go to bed, but it's hard. And so, yeah, the, the students, they see that. So academic research isn't, isn't a job where you show up, you know, you, you put down, you close your laptop and then you go home. You put in a lot of work because you care and you get a lot out of it. A lot of satisfaction comes out of doing research. Hmm. What's some of the, the pieces of advice you have for those students who come up to you at the end of lectures and, and tell you they want to do what you want to do, that you do, tell you that they want to do what you do um, and want to do research? What, what sort of advice do you have for them? Well, I definitely tell them they can do it. If I can do it, anyone can do it. Oftentimes it leads to, well, how did you get here? And then I'll, t- I'll tell them, I'll tell them my path. And I really encourage them. So I wasn't the best undergraduate student. I will say that. Um, I didn't find a lot of motivation, so I didn't graduate with the highest GPA. And so a lot of undergraduate students think that that will hinder them from doing graduate research. And I have to tell them no, because graduate research, again, is not dependent on how well you take a test. It's how creative you are. And oftentimes in engineering, that's looked down upon. They don't want you to be creative. Okay, They want you to follow the second law of thermodynamics. So I think it's it's important for me to tell the students that if that is something they want to do, do it. And I, I oftentimes volunteer my services. So I will help write those applications. I bring in undergraduate students all the time. And the biggest thing about students who want to enter research and have never done it before is I tell them the greatest thing that they can do for themselves is to figure out if they like it or not. So I I remind students that just because you go into it doesn't mean you have to like it. If you don't like it, that's awesome. Better to find that out as an undergrad than your third year in your PhD. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Mm -hmm. How do you, is there anything you suggest people do to test out their, their fit for doing research? Yeah, to come into the lab. That's the only way to do it. Uh, the only way to know if you're cut out for research is to fail many times. Uh, so students, they usually just fail. <laughs> like their, their experiments will just fail and fail and fail. And then one will work. One will work. And if they like that, if, that's, if that is a feeling that they want to hold on to, that's it. They're done. They're in research for the rest of their lives. But, but if they don't understand why something is working and it's just frustrating and they don't see the point, then that's, that's great. That is awesome. And they probably shouldn't go into research. Yeah. It's definitely a, a field that is, is not for everybody from, from my experience. Like I saw like both in myself and in colleagues that it's, it is hard and you need to have, or for, at least for me, having a really, strong or clear understanding of why I was there and why I was doing it was really important because without that, I probably would have uh, found it much harder to sort of keep showing up each day and doing the work. Yeah, absolutely. So for those students where I know that they like the research, but they're doing research, so there's ups and downs, no matter if you love it or not, I send almost all of my undergrads and all of my graduate students to multiple conferences to talk to other students, not just the ones at their university, because they're going to go out there and they're going to hear all the other students complain, but then they're going to meet students who are graduating, who are getting great jobs. And so that is an amazing way to, to encourage them. And I can only send them to a conference if they do the work. So it helps, it helps motivate them for the students who care about the research, but they just, they get so frustrated just to give them sort of that, that light at the end of the tunnel. 
So I'm excited. I have an undergrad presenting at a conference next week, and she's flying out to San Diego. She's so excited. It's awesome. Yeah, that's really awesome. Um, I I did really enjoy the conferences as part of my PhD experience. I only got to do a couple because of uh, COVID kind of got in the way there. Um, but it was a very unique and exciting experience to be able to fly. Uh, like I flew to the US from Australia to, to present for a for a conference and then came back like, you know, within three or four days. And that was just, yeah, it's a fun experience and you get to, to meet different people. Oh, it's absolutely fun. And that is what makes academic research fun as well. And there, are, there are some really nice perks to what I do as a career. And I would say traveling around the world to talk to like-minded people, to brainstorm about ideas, to solve the world's problems is probably the coolest thing ever. It is the coolest thing ever. Um, and yeah, it's great for my students to get those experiences. And oftentimes as a student, you're still trying to figure out where you want to live, where you want to go. So it just gives you that experience as well. Yeah. What, what steps would you recommend for students who are interested in getting into the cultivated meat, uh, cultivated meat research space? Um, talk about it to other people. So I didn't know anything, well, maybe something, but I didn't know anything about cultivated meat until I had a student apply to my lab and say, hey, um, those materials that you're using to do all these other things, we could grow meat on them. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> he goes, well, cultivated meat, it's this thing and people are doing it and here's what people are doing. And I was like, no way. So that's how I got involved is, is it was a student coming to me. And so students just need to, one, talk to a professor, which I know is so hard, but go to them and then ask them if they've heard about cultivated meat. Because who knows, you may end up starting a revolution at your university like my student has. He's unbelievable. But just ask that question because you know what? They probably haven't heard about it. You probably don't know anyone who's working on cultivated meat. But I think that's the beauty of it is you, you have the potential to light a spark in someone's eye just by asking a question. Yeah, that's really awesome. Um, I think, you know... In terms of the impact that students had on both you personally and then all the students you've now gone on to inspire to go into this space, like it, that's a that's a huge impact, really. To to think that uh, I presume sort of like graduate student has just come to you and said, "Have you heard about this? Uh, we could, yeah. you know, we could maybe do some research on this." Uh, has just changed the whole trajectory of of your career. Oh my God, it completely changed the trajectory of my career and it, it sparked something in me. I did a bunch of orthopedic research and I did tissue sealants and it was okay, but I didn't feel like it was going anywhere. And so when he told me about this, I was like, okay, yeah, this sounds like a worthy cause. Let's go ahead and do this. And it's not that different than what I did before. It's just that I didn't know about it. And so it is, it is pretty incredible to think of, even at my university, what that one student has done. He's been interviewed by multiple news outlets. He started the UVM Cell Ag Club. It's, it's been absolutely remarkable. And he remains humble. He is honestly just very, very happy to like spread the word. And it is, wow, it's, it's like a like Gandhi. I don't know. It's just, it is incredible. It's incredible. But he really is. He's very, very humble. He just, and he's so happy. He's so happy that this is what I do. He is absolutely thrilled. But it, it was just one student asking one question. That's it. Yeah. That is it's uh, it's incredible. That's crazy. Is that it's absolutely crazy. And so anytime anything happens, I was um, a panelist at that, oh, the Cell Ag Day, that little meeting that Professor Kaplan had put on where Mark Post was there. Um, I don't, Isha was there from New Harvest, a couple other people, but there were like a hundred people in the room. 
and I was there and I was sitting on stage and I was like, what am I doing here? You know, like, what am I doing? But I was there again because one student asked me one question. I know. Yeah, that's just, that's amazing. Uh, what, what mm-hmm. would you have, say there's a listener who is interested in cultivated meat and has a professor in mind, how would you... How should they pitch it to the professor? Or is it just simply sending them an email, knocking on their door and asking them the question? Or, or should they, how much pr- preparation should they, they do and what should they try to bring to that conversation? Oh, great question. So the preparation would be just understanding the research that professor has done before and where they've come from. Um, maybe if you can talk to other students that are in that professor's lab as well. I think an email is the first pass, just so you don't sort of bombard them in their office. But keep the email short, three sentences, maybe, saying something about their research, what you found interesting, um, if you could set up a meeting with them to talk about cultivated meat, and just like those three things, and see what they have to say. If you keep it short, they will respond. If you, if you make it very, very long, then it's hard to differentiate between um, real honest questions and and thoughts and curiosity about research versus someone who just wants to put something on their CV. So you have to really stand out and yeah, pitch yourself, pitch your idea. If you want to, when you sit down in front of a professor, give them some facts, give them some data. Irfan pointed me in the direction of like five websites. I just, I had no idea. So go there with that preparation as well. If you want to sell someone on an idea and get them to be as excited as you are about it, then give them some information that will make them excited about it. And it is very nice if you can make a tie with anything that they've done before, because sometimes it's scary doing something new. But if you're comfortable, then you're more willing to do it. Yeah, how important is it to sort of think about funding in those scenarios? Like if the student can sort of somehow bring funding with them or access to funding in that scenario or have ideas about avenues for funding? Funding can be as simple as the traditional ways that you would get funding. So you could get a stipend for doing research. You could become a graduate teaching assistant and any of that. Um, So to go back to what I said before, if there is anything in that professor's past that would easily make a connection to cultivated meat, then that professor already has a lab set up to do that. It might not really take that much more money for them. So for me, mm -mm, no, no change really was needed in my lab. No change, really. Yeah, no, no change. And so... In that regard, I didn't really need any more supply money, but what I needed was the students to be paid. And so that can be done with any any mechanism. And a student can receive credit to do research as well, but I would not let money stand in the way. And my standpoint, this is my personal view, is that my job as an educator is to give someone an education and not have them worry about getting paid. So I will do everything I possibly can to make sure that the student's mental energy is not going to, how do, how do I do what I love and put food on my table? I would hate for anyone to have to go through that. So I don't, I don't want anyone to worry about the money when they go into that conversation with the professor just to talk about the research. Don't worry about the money. That can be the second conversation. Yeah, terrific. Yeah, I think that 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 can be a hard part for people who wanted to go into research. Uh, I think that's a really, uh, I'm sure it's very reassuring for your students to know that you have that that mentality when it comes to to that aspect of of the research life. <laughs> well, yeah, but sometimes it can be stressful. Oh yeah, for so sure. yeah, so I don't have a five year grant for growing meat. That would be amazing. So what do I do is I piece stuff together. And so I just tell my students, like, we'll figure something out, you know, like, it'll happen. Don't worry about it. And it does. It always happens. And I think one reason is um, 
I believe in my students. If they're excited and I know they're doing good work, then I will go fight for them and I will get them scholarships. I will get them assistantships. So again, for any, any student who may be listening, if you have an interest and a passion in something that even slightly aligns with what a professor may be doing, go talk to them. Just go talk to them about your idea. And if you are passionate about it and you really want experience with research and you can get that across, just allow that conversation to happen organically. And then you can talk about the money. But oftentimes, once that excitement has been sort of planted into a professor, there's no stopping them. They'll get you money, you know? Yeah, that, that, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. What, what are your top three resources for people who are interested in working in cultivated meat research or just interested in the space in general? What did you find oh. most valuable when you were, you were coming into it? Oh, so me personally, when I was going into the research space, yeah well either for you personally what did you find really valuable or what do you find that you're recommending to your to your students or new starters who are interested in the space at the moment yeah um i tell them to lean on their expertise or lean on their interest so everyone has skills almost every engineer can intuitively understand something something like i am terrible at fluids but i understand thermo um lean on what you're familiar with lean on what you know. So when I first entered this space, not having any idea with where the research was, I started Googling cultivated meat materials because I was a materials person. And so students of mine who are interested in this, but they don't know what they want to do is I will ask them, well, well, what classes do you like? What concepts do you like? What hobbies do you have? And then usually it will come out that, oh, they like this. And then it's just a conversation of showing them this is where your interest would apply in this field. And it always does. I never have trouble taking a student who's interested and worried that they have no skills whatsoever and getting them to realize that they have a pretty awesome background in one aspect of that industry. Yeah, that's terrific. Um, I guess one final question or second last question. Uh, (laughs) What do you wish you had invented and why? Oh my God. Oh, I don't know. Oh my God, was that a question I was supposed to read ahead of time? (laughs) Um, What do I wish I could have? The things that I love and enjoy don't necessarily need to be an invention. You know what I wish I would have invented? A window. Seriously, can you imagine life without windows? That'd be pretty miserable. (laughs) I mean, I don't know if anyone invented windows. Um, That's fine. I mean, windows is a great one. Uh, I think... (laughs) I have in houses and, without windows. I mean, I've been in <laughs> I've been in labs without windows. I've spent me too many many yeah. years more more years in labs without windows than I care care yeah. to have spent. So uh, definitely, windows are valuable. Well, I guess I guess okay. So to back up that silly that silly ridiculous <laughs> answer is um, I'm teaching a lecture right now for my class that is on smart materials where they are windows but they are just as insulating as like a concrete wall Uh and they collect energy. And so they act as a solar panel, but you can see through them. And so inventing those types of materials are just absolutely remarkable without taking away the quality of life. Hmm. So it's like a thermal battery, but it's transparent effectively. Like it stores, it just has like thermal mass that can store or is good at capturing energy from the sun and storing it and then distributing it into the into the building to keep to warm it during winter or exactly exactly so it will hold on to that energy and store it but it is a smart material in response to the environment so if the temperature becomes warmer or it becomes cooler then it's able to do something with that heat energy that it's sort of stored and collected Um, but otherwise it can be sold back to the electrical company like people 
normally do. Oh, so um, it, it actually does produce electricity as as it's yes. collecting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it it it's multifunctional and it's all based on um, how different animals out there create different materials that allow them to breathe. So. That's awesome. Yeah, I. Sean, that is an unfair question. I hate that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is. It, it's a tough one without any preparation. That's for sure. It is. It is. No, I know. I wish I would have prepared. Although, honestly, if you would have given me a month, I don't think I would have come up with an answer I would be satisfied with. Yeah, that's fair. I, I, I mean, the the transparent windows that can produce electricity are pretty awesome. Uh, I yeah. definitely want to learn more about those now. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, I can forward you the paper for reading yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, please do. That, uh, that sounds fascinating. I will. If people want to get in contact with you or learn more about your research, where's the best place for them to find you online? Um, LinkedIn is really nice. It gives an overview of what I do. And then there is a link to my website. So my laboratory is called the Engineered Biomaterials Research Laboratory, or the EBRL. And so you can find the lab website at uvmebrl.com. Terrific. Well, Rachel, thank you very much for joining me today. This has been a wonderful conversation. Yeah, likewise. Thank you so much, Sean. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Rachel. For detailed show notes and valuable resources related to this episode, please head to engineeredforimpact.show forward slash Rachel. That's R A C H. AEL. If you want to support the podcast, the best thing you can do is leave us feedback. So if you head to the show notes page for this episode and scroll down to the bottom, you'll find a form there where you can let us know any thoughts you had on this episode, feedback on things that we did well or things that you would like to see improved. We really want this show to be as valuable for you as possible. So by leaving us feedback, you can help us improve the quality of the podcast. Thanks for listening and happy problem solving.